Okay, so a very good afternoon to Associate Professor Kaldun, Dr. Munawar, Dr. Ruth Sabrina, our panelists, Dr. Emilia Santamaria and Dr. York Lesman, as well as Dr. Derek Chiang, and to all the other fellow doctors in attendance and the final year medical students. My name is Karan and I'll be emceeing and moderating today's webinar and forum. Welcome to the second series of the Clinical Toxinology Webinar organized by the Emergency Medicine Department of Hospital Chancellor Tunku Mohris in collaboration with the College of Emergency Physicians Special Interest Group in Clinical Tox Toxinology, the Remote and Benomation Consultancy Services, Malaysian Society of Toxinology. In this webinar and forum, we aim to explore the topic of clinical toxinology, is it relevant to medical students? So without further ado, to deliver our welcoming remark, please join me in welcoming Dr. Munawar Hatta. Dr. Munawar is a consultant emergency physician in Hospital Chancellor Tunku Muris. He is also a senior medical lecturer in the Faculty of Medicine, UKN, and has a PhD and, and a PhD researcher at the University of Manchester, UK, in humanitarian and conflict response. He has a vast experience in his field of expertise. Without further ado, Doctor, the mic is yours. Thank you, Kiran, um, and thank you for that <laughs> flattening introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, good morning to uh, Dr. York and, and those uh, in the other side of the world. Thank you uh, for inviting me to, to give the welcoming speech. Uh, indeed, it is uh, an honor to be in the presence of our expert panelists, um, our uh, utmost appreciation on behalf of the uh, department and also the Faculty of Medicine uh, to have you on board. Um, I think this is the second series of uh, um, the seminar with medical students. Uh, in fact, um, the feedback from the previous group, uh, I think, was very, very positive. And uh, as part of the faculty, I think we look forward to have more of uh, this kind of uh, sessions. Um, I must say that um, this session is done in a very uh, apt time uh, because we are in the midst of a curriculum review, um, not just uh, in our university, the National University of Malaysia, UKM, but uh, the other universities as well. Uh, and we have the uh, uh, board of curriculum. And, and one of the things that we look to improve is uh, in terms of content. And one of the key areas in terms of emergency medicine is uh, toxinology. And, and based on the uh, uh, previous sessions with the students and the lecturers, I think uh, it's quite obvious that this topic um, um, has become uh, one of the core uh, knowledge uh, to be acquired by medical students. So um, uh, I think we will then propose um, for um, this topic to be included in the new curriculum, although we will take time, but uh, um, I guess uh, never too late to start, um, as we are seeing more and more cases, uh, not only in our hospital, but uh, in the hospitals all over the country and uh, the other parts of the world as well. So um, again, uh, a big thank you to uh, Dr. Jock, uh, Dr. Emilia, uh, Dr. Derek, um, and Dr. Ruth, of course, um, and, and the rest of you to be able to join in uh, our session today and uh, I look forward to um, for the rest of the session. Uh, thank you again um, for, for joining us. Back to you, uh, Karen. Thank you very much, Dr. Munawar. Indeed, it was a very good opening speech. It highlights the importance of, it will be highlighted later, the importance of clinical toxinology and how it's relevant to medical students as per our theme for this second series of the webinar. So, Ladies and gentlemen, joining us today, we are very grateful to have the panel of experts. First up, allow me to introduce them. We have Dr. Melia Santa Maria from the Philippines. She is an emergency medical clinical consultant for the Department of Emergency Medicine, Philippine General Hospital, with over 15 years of experience in emergency medicine. She is actively involved as a speaker and facilitator in clinical toxinology and emergency web medicine webinars and training courses and workshops, not only in the Philippines, but across the world. She has at least eight research papers published under her name. Next up, please join us in welcoming Dr. Jörg Glassman from Germany. Dr. Jörg is a medical doctor specialized in internal medicine, infectious diseases, and public health. 
He works as a postdoctoral scientist and is currently the head of the research group Snake Bike, Snake Bites and Venoming at the Bernard Notch Institute of Tropical Medicine in Hamburg, Germany. The main focus of his work in the field of toxinology is epidemiology of snake bites and the respective snakes, clinical studies, training of medical students and nurses in the management of snake bite, snake bite patients and community education in Laos and Vietnam, in Southeast Asia and Ghana and Gabon in Africa. Last but not least, please join us in welcoming Dr. Derek Chiang from Taiwan. Dr. Derek is an assistant researcher for the National Poison Center Taiwan. He holds a PhD in toxinology and dynamics from the Institute of Bioinformatics and Structural Biology, National Tsinghua University in Shenzhou. Dr. Derek is also very active in his contribution to the science of clinical toxinology with nine publications under his name. A warm welcome, doctors, and thank you very much for joining us today. Next up, I'd like to invite Mr. Wan Kamarun and Ms. Lee Yishuan, our fellow final year undergraduate medical students, to introduce us to the topic of clinical toxinology and to present some case scenarios encountered in Hospital Chancellor Tan Kung Morris in the past weeks. So the mic is over to you, Yishuan and Kamarun. All right, thank you, uh, Karan. Uh, so greetings to everyone, uh, to the profs, to the doctors, and my fellow friends. Uh, so my name is Juan Kamarun. So I will be uh, I will be giving a short introduction about uh, toxinology. All right. So what is toxinology? So toxinology is a uh, it is a, an established uh, field of scientific research in which uh, is focused uh, study on the substance produced by living organisms, meaning it is a substance that was uh, naturally created or it is a non-synthetic or non-man-made non -man substances. So uh, in which it will be, uh, it, it is delivered as a venom or it could be reside within the tissues of animals, plants, mushrooms, or bacteria, uh, in which uh, this substance uh, may harm the target organisms. And next slide. All right, so uh, it is to be noted that toxinology are not the same as toxicology. Of course, as uh, the spelling, the toxin, the N, and the toxic with C. So toxicology is a study of the adverse effect of substance or any chemicals regarding uh, whether it is a natural or man-made substances. All right, next slide, please. All right, so what is clinical toxinology? So it is a specialized area of a clinical medicine. So it's basically almost the same as the other field of uh, in clinical medicine, such as surgery or medicine, internal medicine. So clinic, uh, clinical toxinology focus on the pathoph pathophysiology, uh, the diagnosis, the treatment, as well as the prevention of disease causes by the animal, plant, mushroom, and also microbe. So it covers a very wide range of medical conditions uh, that are resulted from uh, envenomation and poisoning. So envenomation and poisoning are uh, two different terminologies that are frequently used in the clinical uh, toxinology. And this actually brings, uh, it has two meanings, it has, it has two different meanings. So envenomation is actually the exposure to the venom uh, that contain toxins. Uh, so it results from the bites or sting from venomous animals. While poisoning is the administration uh, of poison inside one body via swallowing, inhalation, or absorption through the skin. So the difference between venom and poison is, uh, venom is actually a specialist type of poison uh, that evolved for a, spe a specific purpose. So because of the venom uh, actually contain a mixture of small and large molecules, so they need uh, a wound to enter the body and to be, must, uh, to be effective, it must find its way into the bloodstreams. Right. Slide please. All right, so the most easy ways to remember the difference between poisonous and venomous is uh, if you bite it and you die, uh, it's called poisonous. But if it bites you and you die, it's called venomous. Also, you need to be, we need to be noted that not, uh, it doesn't mean that if it bites you and you die, it is venomous. For example, let's take uh, lions. You know, lions, they bite their prey and the, their prey die. It doesn't mean that uh, they are venomous. So venomous is, uh, the administration of uh, harmful substances into the uh, target organism. All right. All right. So, please. All right. So, for the students' perspective before this webinar, so actually, many of us uh, never heard of the term toxinology before. Uh, even I personally thought that it was a typo. 
uh, as in toxicology. And we didn't even know the difference between the uh, the difference between envenomation and poison. Uh, what is the difference between venom and poison? Are they the same things? Uh, actually, it's not. And then we are not sure. Uh, we most of us also think that toxins are used uh, to treat medical condition in this uh, uh, toxinology fields. And also some things that we used to treat uh, things that related to toxin. But however, uh, after we watched the lectures as well as the study materials that were given to us, uh, we came to understand that actually uh, it's a quite broad topic and it's very, very uh, interesting topic for us. So is it important for medical student? Yes, it is very important for us because uh, as we all know that Malaysia is a tropical country uh, rich in biodiversity. So it's not uncommon to have a case of snake bite, uh, marine related envenomation, mushroom poisoning, as well as arthropod envenomation. So even though it is very rare for us to see this kind of cases in the city, uh, however, there are chances that we might be posted uh, to rural areas uh, for our housemanship. So higher chance of uh, encountering this kind of cases. So this, this is a very uh, important topics for us uh, because this case could be an emergency and probably life-threatening. So having a sufficient knowledge regarding this topic uh, can actually help us to provide basic management uh, as well as who to refer to uh, whenever we encounter this kind of cases. All right. So clinical toxinology in Malaysia. So there are actually several uh, kind of organization that are present in uh, Malaysia. So the first one is the MST, uh, Malaysian Society on Toxinology. Uh, so it was established in 1992, uh, which is the purpose is uh, for the toxin research, uh, toxin research and also cl clinical toxinology. Uh, since then, uh, they had a significant number of high quality research and also publica publication contributing to the field of the toxinology in Malaysia. And next we have the Remote Envenomation Consultancy Service uh, or RECS. So it is a risk management support system uh, is developed to assist the healthcare professionals at various levels of clinical management uh, for envenoming and poisoning. So it is a 24 hour on call consultation service and also a training provider uh, for healthcare professionals since 2010. So the main objective is to enhance the uh, favorable outcome by optimizing and advocating appropriate treatment uh, modalities at every level of clinical management. And then lastly, we have the Clinical Toxinology uh, Special Interest Group uh, by the College of Emergency Physician. Uh, this is, is a very, uh, it's very recent uh, establishment. Uh, it was established in 2022 this year. All right. Next slide, please. All right, so let's move on to the first case of the uh, presentation. All right, next. All right, so this patient, a 30-year-old Bangladeshi gentleman, uh, presented to emergency department with a snake bite of uh, unknown species. Uh, so at the time, he was working around construction site, uh, going to canteen on a soil path, when a snake suddenly emerged from a pile of crates and uh, it bite him once on the left uh, the foot dorsum. So at the time, he was wearing a slipper at the time. So after he was beaten, uh, he then applied uh, two tourniquet above the beaten uh, area around 10 to 15 minutes later. However, one hour later, uh, he developed severe pain and was brought to emergency department by his friends. So at the emergency, uh, he appeared to be drowsy and lethargy as well as uh, had a profuse sweating. So for the examination, uh, revealed that he had poor, poor uh, pulse volume as well as cold clammy peripheries. However, the vital signs are stable. So he was given uh, IM antitetanus, uh, adrenaline, morphine as well as fentanyl and also mesalon and wound dressing was done at the time. Uh, so the pain was reduced to four over 10. Uh, and then uh, his friends chose to the doctors uh, at the emergency department. However, uh, they couldn't identify, identify the, uh, the species of the snakes. Sleep please. So this picture shows the snake bite wound at the left dorsum uh, with fang embedded. So on the left picture, you can see there is a, a laceration uh, which caused by the uh, the snake bite. And also on the right picture, you can see in the circle, there is a, a fang that embedded into the wound. 
Alright, so this is the pictures of the snake that were given to us. Ah, uh, this a uh, this a uh, Najakotia or monoclete cobra. Ah, uh, so ah uh, locally it was known as a uh, ular tedong sendok. So this a uh, ah uh, it was identified by ah uh, our specialist Prof Haldun and okay next slide. And then ah uh, it was started on the Najakotia antivenom NKV ten vials. So this uh, treatment uh, was uh, completed in one hour and the patient did not experience any side effect and the pain reduced to 2 over 10. So vital sign was stable and patient was able to sleep. However, uh, the next day around uh, early in the morning, 3.50 hour, uh, patient developed fever with chills uh, and then he was given uh, augmentin, tramadol, uh, panadol, uh, PCM and uh, the fever was uh, slightly subsided. So at the time, uh, there is a dermonecrosis, dermonecrosis uh, of 3 by 2 cm and also swelling up to the ankle. Uh, at the time, a uh, patient does not have any pain or it's just a mild pain, 1 over 10, and vital sign was stable. And he was given a left leg spin. All right, so uh, in the morning, uh, he again developed fever and he was given a tablet uh, Voltaren, a uh, tablet uh, paracetamol, uh, as well as uh, augmentin. So it was uh it it uh it subsequently uh, resolved the fever and during the uh, in the evening uh, the FNLT was also resolved. Uh, however, the pain score uh, uh patients start to have uh, another pain. However, it's just very mild, uh, three over ten. Uh, the demo the dermal necrosis was still steady and the RPP uh, rate of proximal swelling progression uh there is no progression and vital sign is still stable. So during the night. Uh, he was admitted to a medical ward uh, in view of recurrent fever, swelling, uh, until milk cough, uh, 6 cm below the knee, uh, tenderness, as well as uh, they also continue the compression to the patient. All right, so on day three, uh, patient had a pain score of 4 over 10 with temperature spike. Uh, swelling also increased uh, up to 3 cm below the knee, and the dermal necrosis started to extend to the lateral medullus. So they suspected a cellulitis and to rule out uh, abscess. On phys physical examination, uh, patient is febrile, uh, BP is normal, heart rate also normal, SpO2 normal, uh, respiratory is normal, GCS is normal, and CRT is normal. Otherwise, uh, system examination is uh, unremarkable. So on day four, uh, RECS was consulted uh, in view of worsening cellulitis, uh, multiple temperature spike, also the worsening area of demonecrosis. And then uh, based on the consultation, uh, based on the review, uh, the, uh, the patient was to refer to ortho if the demonecrosis uh, became worsened. So on day five, uh, unfortunately, uh, the dermal necrosis did become worsen and uh, he was referred to ortho for wound debridement. So on day six, uh, they had a wound debridement done uh, by the foot and ankle team. All right, uh, intraoperatively, uh, the foot and ankle team found that uh, there is a liquefactive necrosis of the subcutaneous tissue, uh, anterolateral left ankle, extending to the dorsum of forefoot. Uh, it's measuring around 8 by 30 centimeters. So the fascia is involved. However, the uh, underlying muscle is healthy. And pus was extracted around 50 cc. So post-op, uh, patient was allowed uh, orally accelerated. And distal, charts, uh, distal circulation chart was done. Uh, IV inosine was continued as well as uh, uh, PCM, uh, tramal, and also, and also uh, tissue and pus was uh, sent. So this is the pictures of the uh, wound debridement, as you can see. Uh, it's a very big uh, wound debridement, uh, anterolateral uh, left ankle that extend, for, that extend to the dorsum of the forefoot. Right. So, so the patient is uh, currently under ortho team uh, to monitor the progress of the wound debridement as well as for daily dressing and analgesia for pain management. Right. So next, uh, I'll pass to my uh, colleague, uh, Lee Yishun. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lee here. I'll be presenting for our second case for today, where we'll be moved from the land into the sea, where we'll be observing a jellyfish sting case happening last month in our hospital. So patient is a 32-year-old Nigerian male presented to our ED 
a day after he was stung by jellyfish during a vacation in Penang. According to the patient, at 6.45 in the morning, while he was performing a, ritual, a religious ritual, he walked into the sea to waist level when he suddenly felt an electric current-like pain over both his thigh, left flank, and left forearm. He did not see the offending agent. He rushed out of the water and lie down on the beach, complaining of severe pain over the affected areas, chest discomfort, and as well as breathlessness. Hotel workers attended to him and sprayed an unknown chemical over the affected areas. They then rushed him to a nearby private hospital. No skin sampling for nematosis was obtained for analysis. During that time, his blood pressure was slightly elevated, high rate tachycardic, good oxygen saturation, and he rated the pain score as a 9 out of 10, which is severe pain. The chest discomfort and breathlessness resolved as he reached the hospital. He was then given intravenous analgesia. He was not keen for admission due to logistic reasons and was discharged against medical advice with oral analgesics. The following day, he traveled back to Kuala Lumpur and presented 30 hours post-incident to our emergency department, complaining of persistent pain over both thighs and left flank. He also had generalized body ache, felt feverish, mild drowsiness, numbness over the affected limbs, sore chops and abdominal cramps, but he has no diarrhea or vomiting. His vital signs were all normal, but slightly elevated blood pressure and a pen score of 7 out of 10. Peripheral and systemic examination were all unremarkable. Examination of the sting area shows red to purplish skin lesions at left anterior thigh, left forearm, left flank, as well as left anterior arm. Patient did not complain of chest pain. However, a 12 lead ECG was done and the result actually showed wolf parkinson white WPW syndrome and left ventricular hypertrophy. A bedside cardiac ultrasound showed good cardiac contractility with no regional wall hypokinesia, but a thickened left ventricular wall. Patient was given intravenous tramadol 50 mg and saline hydration while waiting for the blood and urine investigation results. Blood investigation showed raised creatinine kinase of 647 units per liter and troponin I level was normal at less than 10. Chest radiograph was unremarkable. A repeat ECG showed no evolving changes. This is the patient's ECG showing Wolf Parkinson White syndrome with short PR interval and delta wave with secondary ST segment changes and left ventricular hypertrophy. RECS was consulted and the patient was referred to cardiology for further assessment. Unfortunately, the patient was not keen for admission and he requested for discharge against medical advice again. Patient was discharged 10 hours after arrival with oral tramadol 50 mg, parastamol 1 gram and outpatient cardiology clinic appointment. However, 22 hours later, patient came back to our emergency department complaining of persistent pain with a score of 6 over 10 over the affected site. He denied any chest pain or breathlessness. His vital and physical examination was all unremarkable. A third ECG also still showing similar findings, the Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome, and the repeated troponin level was still less than 10. But then this time, the creatinine kinase level increased to 1,216. He was referred to the medical team and admitted for observation and pain management. This is the sting wound after 54 hours after the incidence. It's, you can see it's still very prominent, but not in a decrease. Throughout the admission, his condition improved. The creatinine kinase level on the following day reduced to 763, and his ECG remained similar. He was discharged well after two days of admission with a final creatinine kinase level of 392, with an outpatient echocardiography and cardiology clinic appointment. That's all for our case presentation. I shall pass back to Karan. Thank you very much, Jason, and as well as Karan. So uh, we can see here how important it is this field of clinical toxinology in approaching patients coming in with these cases. And based on their, their presentations just now, we also see the role in, for example, the RECS, right, in giving appropriate consultation services in assisting healthcare providers to treat these cases.
So thank you very much, uh, Kamarun and Yishuan. So I would like to invite the panelists here to give their comments on the case presentations earlier. Uh, doctors, Dr. Yorg, Dr. Emilia, Dr. Derek, uh, Prof, would you like to say anything about the case presentations just now? Uh, maybe let uh, uh, our panelists well, yeah. 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 Uh, so invite our panelists uh, to give their comments on the whole presentation and also if there are any uh, feedback from the cases uh, that was presented. Maybe Dr. York first. Okay, good morning. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation first to, to be a panelist here. It's an honor for me. And uh, thank you very much for the, for the presentation. And uh, well, for the uh, case one, I, I maybe uh, uh, comment. Uh, it, uh, it was obviously a cobra bite, a Najakaothea bite. With uh, probably an allergic reaction in the in the early phase uh, against the venom, which is really rare. So we have to be uh, careful and and uh, also consider other reason uh, that uh, Naja uh, venom also maybe cause uh, uh, cardiac damage, and that is a, a cardiac uh, shock or cardiac function or. Uh, uh, cardiac rhythm problem in the early uh, phase. And uh, I think uh, it's always good to have uh, troponin and ECG at the beginning and also uh, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, echocardiography uh, to, to uh, 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 have an idea about the, 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 the function of the heart. And uh, uh, of course, hypoxia is, is an important uh, uh, problem also at the beginning. Maybe there is uh, already a respiration problem. It's, it's a neurotoxic uh, toxin, uh, the COBRA uh, inject, and uh, there can be already uh, muscular uh, paralysis and, and, and respiratory paralysis. Uh, uh, causing hypoxia and then also uh, shock uh, shock symptoms, and uh, then after uh, the the early phase is is controlled, uh, the second uh, important phase is infection, and that uh, was uh, well uh, presented that the patient developed a necrosis and uh, a fever and obviously a, a local, here you see on the, on the left, on this picture before, you see the typical, uh, on, the, on the left side, you see the typical discoloration uh, under the skin that is very typical for, for, for cobra bites, uh, the necrosis under, uh, 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 under the skin uh, developing, and then uh, that is the early phase, and then it, it, uh, it spread uh, to the forefoot, and it spread also upwards, and uh, uh, what we saw at the end, uh, the, the huge necrosis developed, and um, I also uh, always uh, recommend uh, when the, when the uh, necrosis developed under the skin, we can try with a fine needle to, uh, to puncture the necrotic area under the skin and, and send it to uh, microbiology examination to tailor uh, antibiotic treatment uh, very quickly. They did it uh, when they did the necrotic, uh, the, the necrectomy, they, they sent for, for, for culture and, and, and sensitivity testing. I think that is very important because uh, some of the, of the bacteria uh, uh, are uh, uh, resistant against certain antibiotics. So it's very important to have an early uh, sensitivity testing and, and, uh, and uh, uh, bacteriology, what kind of, of bacteria are really involved and, uh, and which kind of antibiotics is, is working. And, uh, and uh, the cobra bites, as we see on this photo here, it, it's a huge uh, necro necrotic area and it takes a long time to heal. So you need to really clean the wound. And uh, sometimes you need also to cover uh, these huge uh, skin defects with, with uh, skin transplantation uh, for healing. And what is always very important for, for these huge uh, skin defects 
is uh, early start of uh, physiotherapy. So don't uh, let the food uh, 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 like this, uh, tell the patient to move and, and then tell a physiotherapist to, to come every day and give advice uh, how to avoid uh, at the end uh, uh, stiffness. Of, of, uh, of a joint uh, that, uh, and, and also development of, of scars and the scar contraction, and then the patient cannot move the food, which is a, 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 an important disability after, after cobra bites. Yeah, that is, I think from my side, the main uh, comments uh, for, the, for the cobra bite. For case two, I, I will hand over to the people living near the coast. <laughs> okay, maybe uh, we can invite, uh, yeah, me. maybe Dr. Emilia, Santa Maria, <laughs> your, your feedback on the whole on the whole presentation of the students about the topic and also yeah. the cases. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much again for inviting me for this webinar. And um, uh, I, I, I really uh, want to commend both the reporters, they, the, their report were um, short and concise. So I think um, you're doing all right, doing great actually. And just to add to what Dr. York was saying earlier, I think in regards to the first, first case, um, there we can see the importance of um, prevention of bites really because uh, at the end of the day, um, the bite may be that small, but the complications are really, really life-changing. So I think um, it's really important that um, prevention is like a, a primary thing for us, for all of us um, clinicians, because um, it is actually better to prevent these bites than then, then have to deal with this um, life-changing, as I've said, complications. And um, uh, Dr. York was saying about the the bite um, treatment and all all that ha that that has uh, that um, are needed to be done. And um, primarily, the post care or the post bite care um, takes longer. So I think. You know, it doesn't take us uh, that long to educate people in terms of prevention. So um, I think, uh, as I've said, it's better really to educate people. Uh, I think it's it's going to be much easier to be honest <laughs> to, to to educate people than having to deal with these kinds, especially because not all areas where these bites happen have the resources to deal with these kinds of um, complications. So going back to the jelly stain, um, as was also mentioned by Dr. York, um, it's really uh, important to look at the patient in a holistic way. So he said that, uh, of course, we initially we will have to note the presenting signs and symptoms of the patient. Uh, but then we should not uh, set aside all those things that need to be attended to, especially pertaining to the cardiac um, issues that was present uh, that was noted to be uh, present in this uh, particular patient. So um, it was commendable that all the tests were done, and um, they were really um, very. Uh, keen to address it uh, immediately, so uh, we will we, we were able to see that the patient indeed um, survived. And um, I noted that uh, there was this mention about him wanting to go home. So, because basically people would like if they feel a little bit better, they tend to go home. But it is very important for us to remind them again that. See, this is not just uh, an, an easy case, or we may be able to give them more, um, uh, like uh, teach them how to, to look at it in a way that uh, uh, it is important that they be observed in the hospital. 
especially with these kinds of presentation when um, cardiac issues were noted as well. So uh, with regards to the prevention, as, also, as I also said, uh, also prevention plays a big role in these kinds of, of um, cases. However, um, if I get, got it right, we're, um, I didn't really catch any mention of like warning signs in the area where the beach, I mean, where the incident happened. Were there any um, like uh, warning signs as um, we have been proposing all this, all this time for the prevention of jellyfish things, especially during the times or the seasons when these jellies are all over the waters. So that's that's all from my side as of now. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Emilia. We will hopefully see a case report huh, uh, on, on these uh, jellyfish things. Very interesting. Um, yeah, so we wait for that case report to be published. <laughs> okay, Dr. Derek, maybe Dr. Derek, your comment? Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for inviting me, Dr. Kao. And it's good to know you well at that hard time, all of you, okay. Okay, uh, for the first case, it's a very typical uh, cobra bite. We send necrosis, okay, you say the demo necrosis and with uh, cellulitis <clears throat> and it may be uh, with a fever. Okay, uh, as you know, I'm doing the basic research. So uh, for my comments, I think that the, this, there's one question is that uh, this patient without any uh, uh, neurotoxic symptom, right? It's it, it's a little a surprise for me because the, typically uh, for a calcium bite, you will show uh, the paralysis maybe, right? It doesn't show it. Uh, so uh, maybe it's, maybe the case is bitten by an a spatial uh, calcia uh, with a very low long chain neurotoxic. Okay, that's one. The first thing is I would like to mention that. The second is that uh, in Taiwan, we have the C meter cobra, Naja A chart. We also <clears throat> show that the, the patient bitten by Naja A chart also show the severe demonecrosis. And a lot of scientists already demonstrated that was the induced by cytotoxic, or we will call it cardiotoxic. Uh, this toxin is the main component to induce the, uh, the necrosis. And however, if you cannot give you the antibiotics uh, immediately, the damage will continuously to progress. Or even you give in maybe 10 vials, in that case, I noticed that it's 10 vials, right? Yes. And you are not giving any more. No. Uh, no more, right? No, no more. Yeah, no. So uh, the necrosis were extended, followed by the lymph uh, lymph vessels. In in our case, but we don't know that in that case is extended or not. No, no, no blister. No, no. no. So, uh, in, in 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 Taiwan, we have some uh, some just a few cases with blister, oh. and it may be with the some metalloplasts were digested and then the, the epidermis and dermis separated, okay? So uh, it's a quite similar. And uh, for, for me, I think that if the damage is done, antivenin cannot work anymore, yes. okay? But it were extended, so you should give it more antivenin, okay? And uh, for some evidence, it shows it will follow and uh, just uh, uh, extended, fo followed by the lymph vessels. Okay. If we have chance, I, I, if I have chance, I will show you that. Okay. For the, the last is the cellulitis. Uh, why cellulitis happened? Maybe it was uh, infected by the bacteria uh, from the human skin, or maybe from the snake oral, but we don't know. So it will be very important to distinguish it. 
it will be helpful for, for us to uh, choosing a good uh, antibiotic. For that case, it's giving an augmenting, right? It's also English, very common in Taiwan, right? Yeah. I think the, the antibiotic was changed uh, when patient went to the ward. Uh, yeah, it? yeah. Yeah, so they changed from that. augmenting as the initial broad spectrum and then they will tailor to the culture and I think they changed to third generation cephalosporin. Okay, okay, okay. I noticed, I just want to mention that the, it's very important to distinguish that the bacteria, well, where is the, the bacteria come from? Okay. Yeah. And the last thing is that about the pains and swelling. It's all induced by PLA2, okay, probably. Based on my uh, based on some researchers' results, uh, but this um, antibiotic probably is not really uh, working for that because that the main uh, ability to uh, neutralize is that ability that is that the phospholipase activity of the PA two, but uh, as we know, the PA two have by activity. I mean that they have the two ability. One is maybe it's associated with the pain, the other one maybe is the, with the necrosis. Okay, but we don't have evidence. So so far, uh, we will give you more anti if the patient still feel pain. Okay. Okay, that's a, maybe it's all the information that I can come for you. Okay. So uh, did we did we grow any um, any organism from this, Kiran? I think the the result is still pending. The last time I saw the patient. Okay, it would be nice to follow up uh, to see what's what's in the organism because uh, from from our past experience, the most common uh, organism we grow is the Morganella morganae. Um, uh, so bacteria, yeah. yeah. So, uh, it will be interesting to see what which organism grown uh, in the uh, tissue culture and also the aspirate. Okay, Dr. Amelia, you raised your hand. Is there something you'd like to? Yeah, I, I noted two questions for, for me at the chat box. Yes, so, yes. um, I was being asked if clinical toxino toxicology. Is a part of the undergraduate curriculum in in uh, uh yeah can 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 we can we keep it first for after this oh, okay. uh yeah yeah Derek right. want to comment on the second case is it sorry about that oh no worries doctor we will have a Q and A session uh, later on in the forum all right so, all right yeah okay, Derek you want to continue your comment for the second no. case no uh, I I saw that there's uh, some some Tell questions you. right. Yeah, do you have any no, comment no. on the jellyfish? No, okay. No, I, I have no idea about that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so, uh, okay, so we, we'll, we'll, we'll go on, continue with the forum. These are two very interesting cases that we, we have already seen and we are still managing. But in our case, the, I think for the snake bite, it's the first time that we see uh, a cobra fang on the wound itself uh, that came to the hospital. And I have the fang with me. I'll, I'll try and take a picture under a good uh, microscope later and show you the, uh, the, the fang. But it's very interesting because it shows that uh, some of the fang can break off and form a foreign body. Uh, this is particularly so if, let's say, from a python, and uh, python fangs, uh, they don't have fangs, they have many curved teeth, and these tend to break off and uh, lodge into the skin. So that a patient can present with multiple lacerations or even macerations uh, with, uh, with foreign bodies inside the wound. So, uh, sometimes we uh, we can't see with our naked eyes, and that's where the role of uh, maybe an X-ray can actually show some of these teeth uh, lodged in the skin, and uh, that may require a surgical uh, intervention to remove the foreign bodies. Okay, so just to bear that in mind, we are lucky that this one is just still on the skin, and you can see the foreign body uh, on the skin itself. Huh? Uh, okay. So uh, let's move on to the Q&A session. Maybe uh, Karan would like to ask a few questions from our participants. Yes. Our panelists. So, sure. So, so we have our, our panelists, panelists here turn on with... their camera. 
So Dr. Emilia, Dr. York, and Dr. Derek. So thank you very much again for joining us. So we have a few questions in the chat box. We'll keep it open so uh, everyone can keep their questions rolling in. So we have one for Dr. Emilia first. So Dr. Emilia, is clinical toxinology uh, incorporated in the undergraduate curriculum in the Philippines? And if yes, how is it done? So this is from Deshana. Dr. Emilia? Yeah. yeah. So as I was saying earlier, um, uh, initially she was asking about clinical toxicology. However, um, toxinology is not that known yet, but uh, whenever we talk about cases, it's also included in the discussion. And mainly for the clinical toxinology, it is included in the clinical toxicology um, lectures. And more often than not, this is incorporated in um, general surgery uh, rotations as well as lectures. And it is um, being discussed under the environmental trauma section. So um, we don't really have uh, the, the topic under a specific, like, uh, like for example, uh, a major subject such as the toxinology or toxicology, but they are incorporated in the lectures that I have mentioned. Thank you very much, Dr. Emilia. And there's another one for you, Doctor. Uh, this question, what are some prevention that can be done for snake bites and jellyfish stings? I think this is uh, in response to what Doctor, you said, prevention is primary than trying to treat these patients because the effects are adverse. So any advice on what kind of prevention can be done? So uh, the preventions that we have been, uh, the prevent on the prevention side, of, of um, things. Uh, we usually have uh, posters and uh, warning signs in the, in the area where these snake bites and jellyfish things are commonly observed or, or uh, where these bites and things happen. So um, it's really important that we have those things uh, so that uh, people will be aware and more careful. So with regards to snake bites, of course, um, to, how to prevent this uh, to happen? Um, firstly, we need to keep our areas clean because that's where they want to do. And we should not... Um, uh, disturb their habitats. For example, if you're living in the rural areas, uh, don't, please uh, also make sure that uh, your areas are clean and um, there will be no cracks in your um, home. However, as we all know, <laughs> in some rural areas, people tend to sleep on the floor or something like that. So the tendency is uh, sometimes when the snakes uh, um, accidentally look, um, goes, to our, goes into our houses looking for food and all that stuff. So uh, that's when this, you know, accidents happen. So we can firstly, yeah, keep it clean. Don't disturb their habitat. And um, if you are a farmer, or those people who are uh, living in the rural area, whenever you go into the forest or any um, thick foliage areas, then maybe best to wear boots and um, carry a stick or, um, yeah, those things, those uh, preventive measures of wearing appropriate um, boots and gears. And um, of course, uh, one, one, uh, one way of preventing these snake bites from becoming worse also is uh, being able to, do, to know or learn the first aid management, especially when they are in the rural areas. And of course, um, we educate them, telling them not to be wasting time because as we all know, um, we have our tamans and for us we have we call it locally as albolario and um i'm not sure how it, how they are called in malaysia and other areas but like you know traditional healers just to um like a formal way of um referring to this these people so let's not waste time uh bringing the patient there bring the patient immediately to the nearest uh, equipped hospital 
because uh, we may be able to save them. Uh, I mean, we may be uh, more successful in saving them <laughs> than bringing them uh, anywhere else but the hospital. So that's one thing. And also for the snake bites, um, same thing. We need to avoid those areas and wear protective clothing when, whenever we, we, we go swimming into areas. But as I've said, if that area is already deemed uh, to be uh, infested with box jelly or known to have box jelly, uh, I think it's wise not to be their devils and go into those waters. So also, as I've said, protective uh, clothing. And then, um, yes, also, we, if we teach them, we also teach them the first aid uh, for, for these kinds of stains, like for the jellyfish, especially the box jellyfish, at least uh, they will know what to do. And again, uh, be able to uh, bring this patient and avoid doing all the funny things like, uh, you know, the urine thing and all that, the myths and everything. And we have those posters. Actually, we have translated the posters from, from Rex uh, Malaysia. We were able to translate it in our local dialect. I mean, we speak, generally speak English, but I mean, the mode of uh, communication primarily is in, of course, our national language, which is Tagalog. I'm not sure. Um, for other for for the other countries, uh, most likely they also have some translation that has already been done. Thank you. Thank you very much for your feedback, Dr. Emilia. Very eye opening. So for another the, the other question goes to Dr. Derek. Uh, what is the time window to give the anti venom to prevent extensive cardiac damage? So Dr. Derek, you were saying that we need to give it ASAP. So when you say ASAP, uh, what is the frame like? within the first four hours, first two hours, first 12 hours. Can, can you please comment on that? Okay. It's pretty hard to define a time window. You know, the cardiotoxin maybe will accumulate it in at some spe specific cardiomyocyte in a local tissue to induce the, the damage in few hours or maybe few days. So it's pretty hard to define it. So for, in, uh, especially in Taiwan, because that's it. Uh, in Taiwan, the, the victim will arrive at in hospital uh, in maybe in four or five uh, hours, I think. Even you see in the, the highest mountain in Taiwan, he could arrive at it. So in Taiwan, it's pretty hard to find it, the patient with that cardio problem. Uh, and the, there's one question is that how many bullets should be injected to the, to the victim is another question. So my suggestion is that do it quickly, as soon as possible. And maybe you could give him more or uh, give him ex uh, additional vial after you give him 10 vials because that the, the, uh, the binding of the toxins and antibody is dynamic. We don't know which one will be digest first. If the antibody was digest, the half life of the IgG was shorter. That means that the toxic will still have the activity to induce the damage, right? So do it and continuously to do it theoretically. Okay, <laughs> it's pretty hard to do the clinical research for anyone. So we can do it and try to do the research. And I want to mention one thing that's important is that for the case, the snake bites is an accident, right? So if you can collect the valuable uh, blood or maybe saving from the patient, even giving the antivenins or not giving the antivenin at any moment, it's very important for anyone to do that. Uh, that kind of research because you will notice that how many antibodies still maintain in the humans and how many toxins will be returned to the active form. Okay, so that's my answer of the, the first questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Derek. And there's another follow-up question by Dr. Ruth uh, to you. 
any latest study on bacteria isolated from snake bite cases apart from the one published in Taiwan in 2010? So Dr. Derek, comments on that? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I remember the two groups was working on that. One is that uh, from Dr. Mouse, the other one is uh, from the uh, Chang'an University uh, group team. Okay, so they do it, but it's the focus on the, the culture or incubate the bacteria from the pay, the wood. Okay, but uh, the important things that I want to mention is that you do it and you also collect in, uh, the bacterial sample from the, the snake oral or maybe the skin of the snake, you will notice that uh, what is the, uh, you will notice the, re the relationship between the cellulitis and the real reason. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Derek. And Dr. York has replied that there are no snake bites, uh, very rarely there are snake bites and uh, they have, in Germany, Vipera berus, the species of the snake, but it's not as dangerous as those in Asia. And in Germany, there's no dangerous jellyfish as well. Uh, so doctor, what about in Laos? Uh, Dr. Ruth asked in Laos previously. And uh, another participant asked, what then is the most commonly presented cases uh, related to toxinology in Germany? Dr. York? Uh, yes, okay, yeah, uh, first first for Germany, uh, we have the Viparaberos mainly, and it is mainly in the northern part of Germany, and uh, there are a few cases uh, during the summer months, so they start now in June, May, June, until September, uh, there are the cases for, for Viparaberos bites, and uh, these bites usually uh, can uh, uh, cause uh, severe swelling. I have seen uh, patients with uh, swelling of the whole limb, of the whole arm, until uh, the trunk, and, and uh, that is quite uh, severe. But uh, there is rarely uh, coagulation problems in, uh, after these wiper bites, and it's, it's limited to, to swelling. So, uh, Yes, we have antivenom here, uh, and, 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 and sometimes uh, we use it uh, for the swelling. I'm a little bit reluctant, and I'm not sure whether these antivenom are really effective for, for against the swelling. So my experience, at least uh, in, in Germany, I don't have that much experience. We have not uh, many bites, and, and, uh, and, uh, but, for, but for Laos, uh, I uh, have the experience that even if you give early antivenom, the swelling is uh, usually uh, progressing, and I, I'm not really sure. I don't see whether the swelling is really well controlled with antivenom. Anyway. In Laos, of course, we have uh, 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 much more venomous snakes, and I think it's rather similar to Malaysia. It's very similar to Thailand and also Cambodia and Vietnam. So the, the snake fauna is, is, uh, is uh, very similar. So we have the number one uh, snake in Laos is Malayan pit viper. Uh, it's mainly in the southern part of Laos and in the central part of Laos, uh, a lot of Malayan pit viper bite, maybe even 50% in, in some areas, even more than 50% of cases uh, are from Malayan pit viper and, and severe cases. And uh, uh, in the northern part of Laos, uh, there is a green pit viper and there is also a mountain pit viper, the, the Ovophis species uh, uh, we encounter in the northern part, but there are no malign pit viper in the northern part of, of Laos. Until now, I have no idea. In the western part, yes. In the west northern part uh, to the Thai border, there are some cases of Malayan pit viper bites, but not in the mountainous area in the northern part of Laos. It's the same like in Vietnam, from uh, from the I see say uh, the, maybe the, the the 15 or 14 uh, latitude uh, up north in Vietnam, there is no Malayan pit viper, but in the southeast there is Malayan pit viper, and um, for my experience also in the Mekong Delta there is no Malayan pit viper. And in Laos, then we have, of course, we have the cobras. Uh, we have the spitting cobras, Naja siamensis, and we have the uh, Naja caosia, the non-spitting species. Uh, uh, both are dangerous. The Naja siamensis uh, mainly cause uh, local necrosis uh, for, for adults, 
not often uh, neurotoxic signs, but Najakauthia uh, can cause neurotoxic signs and also respiratory failure. Just a few weeks ago, we had one case in, in, in Vientiane and uh, uh, he came uh, with after probably a Najakauthia bite. Uh, he didn't see the, the snake, but it uh, looks looked like, like a cobra bite. And he developed very quickly a respiratory failure. And after antivenom, uh, 16 hours after antivenom uh, uh, administration, uh, we could extubate him and, uh, and he survived. And uh, of course, one very, for me, the most dangerous snakes uh, is, is, uh, is Bungarus. Uh, it's uh, mainly Bungarus candidus in, in Laos. We have also Bungarus uh, uh, fasciatus. But uh, fasciatus rarely bites. Actually, I never uh, uh, saw a snake of, of Bungaros fasciatus uh, so far. Maybe if people try to handle the snake, that happened. But Bungaros fasciatus, uh, they, they, they leave the place uh, before you arrive. I have the feeling. And, and many, many of the Lao people, they tell me because they go frog hunting at nighttime. Yeah, with, with, a, with a lamp on, on, the, on the head, with a headlamp. And then uh, they go in the rice fields, and I always think, why there's nothing happening <laughs> with bungaroos at night when they are frog hunting? Eh? And the, the, they say, yes, we see, we see sometimes bungaroos fasciatus, but they, they leave before we arrive. And, uh, and uh, obviously, they, they rarely bite. But bungaroos candidus, uh, all the cases I saw was bungaroos candidus. And they are really uh, dangerous because they cause long-term uh, respiratory uh, failure, long-term paralysis. So you have to put them on respirator for sometimes two weeks or three weeks, uh, even with antivenom. Uh, it's really uh, dangerous. And that is, of course, long-term intensive care and long-term respiratory uh, uh, assistance has a lot of complications and people may die of, uh, of the complications uh, uh, rather than uh, the, the venom itself. Um, yes, that is, that is the main uh, challenge uh, in Laos. And of course, it, it's always a challenge to, to have uh, anti-venom in the hospitals, I have to say. And now after the after the pandemic uh, with a with border closure for, for so long, so long time, at the moment, I have to say there is almost no antivenom in the whole country. And that is the biggest challenge uh, we have to solve. And I think, uh, 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 yeah, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, really uh, terrible uh, to, to uh, be in the hospital and, and have a, a patient with a malign pit viper bite who is bleeding and you don't have the antivenom in stock. Uh, that is the biggest challenge at the moment in, 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 uh, in Laos. And uh, I think also in, in Cambodia, it will be uh, more or less the same uh, situation. The antivenom uh, availability and affordability for the patients. Now there are more and more also private hospitals uh, opening in Laos, uh, but they sell the antivenom for a price that those poor people from the countryside where they get bit, they, they cannot afford. Yeah, they go home and, and, and go to the traditional healer, no, mm. unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, that's the biggest yeah. challenge uh, until now that this, uh, should, this we, should we Should we send you some more of the expired ones? Yes, always. So okay. I, I, almost, I almost finished uh, the, the, the manuscript now. So we had uh, 31 cases. Yeah. Uh, we, we treated with the expired uh, Malaysian antivenom. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was, uh, it, it is working. Yeah, it is absolutely okay. working. And, and, can, can and I, it, yeah, can I review the paper as well before sending? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, it'll be part I, of I will, the when, I, when I finish it, uh, I will send it to, to, uh, to, to Dr. Tan and, 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 and you and, and, and okay. the others uh, who were involved. Okay. Uh, in, in lab test. Sure. Because yeah. I, think, I think that that will be kind of a groundbreaking paper as well because. We, we only talk about it, but we never really have any real substantial clinical uh, success to show. So yeah. I think that, that will be a very good uh, paper, uh, hopefully will be coming out soon and we'll open up doors for regional cooperation where we don't yeah. waste uh, expired antivenom that is kept well, so we can yeah. still use them and help others. Okay, yeah. so thank you so much, Jok. Uh, uh, so I think we'll 
uh, we'll spice things up a little bit. Can maybe we, we add on another interesting component to the discussion? So maybe Kiran, Kiran can you share the uh, first yes, news clip? Sure. As for the rest of the questions that are present in the chat box, uh, the panelists and uh, doctors, please feel free to review them um, in, in, in favor of the time because they are uh, we will, very we will, interesting. We, will entertain. We, we can still entertain those questions uh, after these uh, news clips. Okay, then. So um, here we have a few news clips. Uh, I will send the links to the news clips into the chat box so that everyone can look, take a look at it. So here, the, four, the first four articles that we'll be looking at highlights the uh, importance of clinical toxinology in research and development, as well as in identifying and treating the patients. And the last three articles then highlight the issues of exotic pets in the context of public health and in the eyes of the law. And I see as well that in the chat box, there are a few questions pertaining to uh, keeping endangered uh, pets and dangerous pets, as well as uh, the panelists' perspectives in the eyes of the law. So shall we review the news articles? Uh, Prof, would you like yeah, to? Go, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I will send the links so that everyone can have a look. So this is the first one. Okay, what is it? Okay, so uh, this article, the first one, is in relation to a jellyfish bite case. Sting uh, case. Sorry, jellyfish sting case. And uh, it, was, it was a warning to the, the people in Kuantan to not touch it because they do not, they cannot identify the species. Yeah, okay. So that, that kind of answer, Dr. Emilia, uh, uh, question earlier whether the location were um, and the local authorities are taking um, taking responsibility to warn the public about the safety in the on the beach. So this, even though this one, if you can see the picture, the sample that they took uh, after one of the people got stung, uh, but it is actually a non. Uh, well, it it can still sting you this jellyfish, but uh, it doesn't. Um, uh, cause uh, life life uh, threatening condition. So it's more of a local irritation type of sting can be causing rash, rashes and itchiness and some local pain. But uh, the, the local authority uh, closed the beach and put up signs that the public don't go into the water until further notice. Uh, the one that the case that we had, the occurrence, the location was at the private beach of a resort. So uh, the resort uh, then put up a sign. Uh, actually, there is a sign, but the, nobody is uh, you know, uh, watching the sea very early in the morning. The, the incident was at 6.30 a.m. So everybody was still sleeping, and this guy went into the sea. So he got stung. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, uh, usually the local resorts has already put up signs, and they have uh, their staff trained to use uh, vinegar, uh, for uh, for those who got stung, and they will actually provide uh, uh, first aid and also send them to the hospital. As this case happened, uh, uh, the guy was uh, sprayed with uh, vinegar, uh, and then he was uh, asked to bring to the hospital after that. Okay, so uh, that's about jellyfish. So there are many jellyfish at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, we also have one case of death uh, last two weeks uh, in Sabah. Okay, so that's a seven-year-old child who was stung by a box jellyfish. And we know this because we did, uh, even though it's a post-mortem sample, we did a skin sampling and uh, Rex was consulted and we identified uh, from the nematosis on the skin uh, that the child uh, was stung by a box jellyfish of Chironex species, most likely in that area is Chironex Yamaguchiai. Okay, so the child collapsed uh, very fast within 10 minutes after coming out of the sea after stung, uh, the child collapsed, uh, but unfortunately, no CPR uh, done at the site. It was only when the child was brought to the emergency department uh, that was already more than uh, 10 or 15 minutes later. So unfortunately, the child did not respond to the CPR and was pronounced dead. Okay, so this is what's happening in our country. Sometimes, uh, you know, like this guy uh, in the hospital, he went. He was managed to. Uh, he managed to be treated in the hospital, but. Uh, most, of, most of the time, the death occurred in children, and children die very fast, uh, succumb to the uh, envenoming very fast huh, after the sting. Uh, if you don't initiate CPR early, 
and initiate the uh, 999 early, uh, the chances of you uh, recovering is uh, very low. Okay, so okay, that's very interesting. So, Dr. Emilia, you want to comment about anything else to add about jellyfish? Um, yeah, so I was, as I was listening, um, you mentioned that uh, no CPR was done, so that's very unfortunate. Yeah. That's why whenever we give training for healthcare workers, especially um, those in the remote areas, we usually incorporate um, basic life support. Um, yeah, so that's why, that's why in our, yeah, that's why in our students, our training, our medical students, we already also incorporate uh, basic life support uh, training for them. Uh, yes. and, and, and this case or topic uh, highlights also how important uh, knowing uh, B BLS uh, to them as well uh, when managing case outside of the hospital. Yes, Dr. Carl. Yeah. That's why whenever we like uh, we have um, scenarios, um, BLS is always incorporated in the um, management of um, snake bites as well as marine envenomation. Whenever we give out trainings, we give trainings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is definitely uh, included, actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, Dr. York, uh, Dr. Derek, you have any comment about that? What about the training of BLS in your country for medical students? In Laos, for example, maybe Dr. York. Uh, what, the... what, what do you mean BLS? Uh... Basic life support. Ah, okay. Uh... In medical schools. Yes, I, I think there is training in, in, in basic life support in, in, in medical school in Laos, but I don't have a lot of experience. I know that there is uh, almost nothing with uh, on, on, in toxinology. Oh, so okay. there is uh, really very little, I think, uh, taught in, in toxinology uh, mm -hmm. snake bite. I'm always surprised when I ask the young doctors, did you have any lecture on, 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 on snake bite and venoming in, in Laos? So it's little done. Uh, I, I tried to, to, to start, but I was not uh, successful until today, so uh, maybe, yeah. maybe next, we, uh, we can make it a success by inviting Rex over to Lao with yes. uh, Dr. Cat as well, so we yes. go with the ministry. <laughs> yeah. that is, that is uh, what about Dr. Derek in Taiwan? We didn't give in, in systemic uh, education Yay, in Taiwan. let's go to Lao! <laughs> uh, hmm? Yeah, Dr. Derek, go ahead. Okay. And uh, we just given uh, the course, maybe just, uh, just one day, one day in the course, okay? Uh, it's not provide for a, any uh, medical college, just optional. Oh, oh yeah. I see. For, for examples, uh, you know, BGH is nearby the Yangming University, right? Yes. They, they provide a course but uh the section talking about snake bite or maybe uh clinical toxicology or colleges is only offer for one day or two day one day oh. or two days yeah okay. we are not uh, which which year two? of their study normally yes which year of the medical student? which year yeah uh the second year Second year. So it's too, it's too young for them. Too, still too early in terms of clinical yeah, context. Yeah. It's not there yet. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. So we, we also provide another opportunity for uh, some student that is interesting in that part. We give them a chance to, to, to serve in mm. our service center. Okay. They've been training to, to do the consulting. So they have right. a second opportunity to, to get a chance to learn about that part. Okay. So okay. uh, uh, Cameroon, our medical student is in which year? Are we doing in the emergency posting? Final year. Fifth year. In the fifth year, which is your final year, right? Yeah, so you guys are rather matured already. So it's okay, that's good. Okay, let's, let's have a listen to uh, one more uh, case uh, maybe in the report, yeah. So this case uh, tells about this uh, man who was bitten by a uh, monocult cobra. Uh, initially, he was in ICU, and now uh, this news reports that he is now safely uh, transferred to a medical ward. Okay, can you move on to the next one about the, the plant? Okay, for this following article, uh, it is on the benefits of oleander as a potential uh, treatment for snake bites and venoming. Uh, Prof? 
Okay, so these two uh, news is uh, uh, actually rather related. The first one is actually a guy who got bitten by a Naja Kautia, uh, and he's uh, in the service uh, sector where he, he goes around and rescues snakes. But he was bitten by a snake at his house. Uh, he kept the snake after rescuing the snake, and it was a monocle cobra. So he was bitten by the snake, but uh, he decided to use a traditional method, which is he uh, took two leaves from a plant uh, that was claimed to, to heal uh, venom from snake bite. And he uh, chewed on the leaf and he applied on the bitten area. He did not go to the hospital. After that, he had a shower. And while in the bathroom, he suddenly felt all the signs and symptoms of envenoming, of sweating, uh, feeling uh, dizzy, feeling like painting, blurring of vision, and has some difficulty in breathing as well. So he called on his wife and he was uh, brought by his neighbor to the hospital. And when he arrived, uh, the pain on, and the swelling already uh, increased and uh, from dermonecrosis. And also he had uh, problems with breathing. Therefore, he was intubated and uh, was given the uh, full dose of antivenom, Naja Kautia. I think it's uh, 10 vials. And he responded well. He, uh, as you can see just now, the news, he was recovering well and he was extubated. And uh, uh, however, the wound, uh, of course, uh, as Dr. Derek said, it can be quite extensive, the demonecrosis. So he, he had uh, uh, incision and drainage and also uh, debridement of the wound. Uh, somehow or other, he also, they also performed some pasiotomy of, on this guy, which I don't understand why. But uh, anyway, they did it and he got some, uh, you know, very bad scars. And uh, yeah, but he, 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 he lives. Uh, but the whole idea here, what we want to see is, you know, it just shows that, uh, you know, even educated people working in the industry of, uh, uh, you know, rescuing snakes, uh, they still practice uh, traditional method, uh, which, you know, unproven, uh, unproven uh, technique of eating plants. So imagine oleander, if, 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 if it was an oleander, and oleander is a poisonous plant, every part of the plant is poisonous. So it can cause cardiac, it has cardiac glycoside, and you can cause palpitation and even collapse. Okay, so, uh, but this guy did not eat oleander, this guy eat that plant, the next plant next to the picture of oleander, uh, in the local name, they, 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 I don't know how they call, call the name, the plant's name, but it's called uh, snake venom plant. So <laughs> just because of the name, they assume they associate that plant to uh, healing uh, uh, venom from uh, venomous snake bite. So again, and, and, and the, 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 the dangerous part is that this plant is uh, widely available even on uh, online shopping. You can buy this plant through online shopping. Uh, it's on Shopee, it's on Lazada. That, that is very, very strange. Uh, with all kinds of these claims that it, it can heal uh, or, or, or you know, treat uh, as antidote for snake venom or even other venomous snake bite. So um, yeah, so this is uh, something that we can discuss. Maybe uh, Dr. Emilia, from perspective of uh, natural, uh, you know, plants, toxicity, and also using plants for environmenting treatment? Yeah, I was, I was really laughing because uh, I, I haven't really heard of this particular plant. But um, more often than not, uh, the traditional healers would just like put some, like they, um, how do you call that? You mash, they mash, they mash the you mash it like the, like yeah. the, you know, mash the leaves and then yes. put it on the the wound. But we have already uh, like we have known for a long time already that this does not work. The first aid, uh, I I noted that there were there was a question on what to do with snake bites. So as I have said, um, uh, also Doctor Sabrina mentioned, do it right. So um, uh, immobilize and then um, go to the hospital right away and tell the doctor, uh, try to describe the, the, the snake that has beaten you. And honestly, with this plant uh, as treatment, uh, I don't think it will really work because as, as uh, you as medical students, 
have already uh, um, read on the pathophysiology of how these snake bites um, happen. So like uh, there are either uh, neurotoxic and hematologic um, complications. So um, like common sense will tell us like <laughs> put plant on the, the bite side, it will not go into the, into the inner uh, tissues or whatever of yeah. our, you know, uh, simply put, um, what you have read uh, in your books and in your, in your studies already will tell you that it doesn't really work. So, yeah. So we hope, we hope that this guy learned his lesson, you know, and he can be an advocate for change because he has a, he is a living proof that the, the traditional medicine or, or, or this plan doesn't work. So yeah. we hope that he will live to tell the tale to his friends who are already practicing this, not to eat the plant. And we can always refer uh, to him again if someone else were trying to eat the plant. And uh, we hope then, uh, you know, something can have, something can be done to really prevent uh, people selling all kinds of uh, jam mambo jumbo in the jumbo. Uh, online shopping, you know, uh, claiming all kinds of, uh, you know, dangerous things. Like this case, example, he, he bought the plant from Shopee, from online shopping. And wow. he believe it, and he he ate it, and uh, you know it nearly cost his life. Well, it actually cost his hand as well. Actually, in terms of uh, uh, morbidity, what about doctor? What about in Taiwan, Derek? Uh, I heard uh, Taiwan is also big on uh, traditionally or, or what you call herbal therapy, uh, and I think there was one uh, case or not case, a study about uh, using uh, plants for uh, maybe as an adjuvant to uh, snake bite. And venoming or ven against venom. Well, I think that's the the all the, the cases that are using the traditional medicine or herb for treatment is all fail. I mean, yes. that we it's not in the hospital, right? Okay, uh, no, so uh, no, he, he was at the home. patient using it by himself. Yes, exactly. Okay, it's yeah. all fail, and the wood was much severe, and maybe yeah. it's uh, uh, get this cellulitis maybe. Yeah, there was okay. a delay as well. There was a delay in going to yes, hospital. Yes, yes, yes. But for my personal opinion is that I think the herb or maybe traditional medicine is working, but it's only for uh, the second step. After you uh, just apply from the hospital, maybe you have some maybe uh, neuron, neuron degeneration, so maybe you have some functional disorders, or maybe you have some, some maybe just chronic problem you oh, can anti ask inflammatory, for anti-inflammatory yes. perhaps yeah yeah I, I think so so yeah so far i think anti pain is more working for any yeah. other way yeah, yeah but if you eat if you eat oleander if you eat this plant then you can have both envenoming and also poisoning <laughs> yes yes yeah oleander, double, you, will, double, you probably die of poisoning damage. rather than dying of envenoming <laughs> it's hard to define right <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay Right, so uh, that's very interesting. So that uh, in terms of poisoning, poisonous plant is also part of clinical toxinology. And we have to know the sign and symptoms of envenoming uh, is quite different or could be the same uh, to the poisoning that this patient may have. If let's say they eat oleander and they get, uh, you know, palpitation, you see the ECG as well. Uh, those things may also present in envenoming. So the question is, which one is which? Is it envenoming or is it poisoning, right? Uh, so that's that can be confusing. So it's uh, it's very interesting that uh, you know this guy <laughs> uh, ate a plant that may actually cost him his life. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Third, uh, maybe we have any questions from the uh, public uh, from our listeners. Is there any questions that we can share? Uh, yes, there are. There are a few questions coming in on the first state management. But as Dr. Emilia and Dr. Sabrina has clarified on the. Do it right, R-I-G-H-T, reassure, immobilize, get to a hospital and tell the doctors that will prove to be the best first aid treatment for any snake bites. So there's also one question on the role of a tourniquet. So tourniquets are contraindicated. We don't practice tourniquets. Uh, and Dr. Derek has explained that it is because it plays a very, uh, it doesn't play a very significant role in preventing the spread of the venom, right? So, and Steve asked, for non-neurotoxic snake bites, uh, also known as hemotoxic snake bites, to what extent of seriousness of the symptoms uh, does it warrant a antivenom? Uh, anyone would like to answer the question? 
Any doubt to you? Uh, yes, I can answer the question. I mean, there, there are clear uh, guidelines for, for, for this by WHO. And uh, the WHO say if the platelet count is less than 50,000, if the INR is more than 1.2, and uh, then uh, for, for hematotoxic envenoming, you should give uh, antivenom. Uh, I think uh, if, if a patient uh, coming uh, to the emergency room, for example, uh, three hours after a malign pit viper bite, and then he presents with a platelet count of, uh, I say, 70,000, uh, actually, I would give him antivenom, even if the WHO say uh, you have to wait until under 50,000, but I wouldn't wait. If it's already 70,000 after three hours, it's, it's definitely under 50,000 uh, uh, another three hours. Uh, and, and then I would give antivenom directly. It is another thing if a patient comes with a malign pit viper bite uh, two days after the bite, and then the platelet count is 70,000, then you can say, okay, maybe it, it's already uh, through the, the nadir and it's going, uh, it's already on the, on the way up. And, uh, and for, for me, for the INR, if somebody is coming with an INR of, of 1.6 or 1.7, also two hours after, maybe I would also go for antivenom directly, but if, if it's uh, after two days, no, I wouldn't. So 1.7 is not a, 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 a INR to be worried about. But of course, you have to consider these uh, hematotoxins are also hemorrhagines. That means they damage the, the, the blood vessels. So uh, 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 a damage, uh, uh, coagulation disorder uh, uh, of, of INR of 1.7 together with the damage of the blood vessels cause uh, bleeding into the tissue. And then also you should consider quickly to give antivenom. So there, there are some, some things to consider and, and, and a very uh, uh, strict um, indication like it's outlined in WHO, uh, I think it's a little bit uh, difficult and has to be uh, uh, seen uh, critically uh, from case to case and also in, in the timeline of the bite. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. York. Yeah. yeah, actually, actually, the thrombocytopenia of lame pit viper is very, very fast. It, it actually caused thrombocytopenia earlier compared to effect on the coagulopathy itself, the INR. It comes a bit uh, later than that. Yeah, you're right. So the severity is based on the time. The timing is important, uh, how, how soon the patient presents. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, uh, the INR, uh, people don't, we, we don't really look at the INR immediately because uh, if you use, if you know, uh, when we treat patient with warfarin, INR of uh, our, what we call uh, therapeutic level uh, to achieve INR is more than 2.5. So mm -hmm. that's therapeutic to the patient. If it's therapeutic to the patient, so it's good, isn't it? <laughs> so we don't have to worry until it's, you know, really significant where we need to stop the warfarin. If you give warfarin, we have to stop. It's actually more than four or five. So um, we can still wait. We've seen cases where the INR is more than seven, even nine, uh, but a uh, patient doesn't show any sign of uh, bleeding. So that is also another thing that we have to bear in mind. If you keep the patient, you know, uh, uh, not mobile, not, uh, you know, rest in bed. And uh, uh, yeah, of course, uh, if someone with INR nine, we will definitely give them anti-venom, anti yes. Uh, but in terms of immediately, you know, becoming panic and so on, that, that should not be the case. Uh, all right. So yeah. Uh, right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, next. Prof. Thank you. Is there any question? Uh, there are a few questions which I've compiled in the chat box, but uh, in favor of time, should we move on to the next uh, few news articles? Because there's one one more question pertaining to the uh, topic of endangered okay, pets. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So sure. for the for the few questions in the chat box, uh, panelists, uh, any doctors who would like to take uh, up we'll, the question? We'll answer it. We'll answer it after. All right, cool, in the chat box. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next news articles. So the next three articles talk about uh, the, um, the topic of endangered pets and uh, in the eyes of the law. So this is not me. endangered pets. This Sorry, is uh, uh, the other one. exotic, Sorry, dangerous, exotic, exotic, dangerous and exotic. Yeah. Sorry, my bad. 
Yeah, uh, Prof, would you like to comment, uh, start off the comments? Yeah, so this one, we had a case. Uh, this one is a well-known case about a few weeks ago, early May, where we had a case of a bite from a, a foreign or exotic uh, viper. Uh, this is a British Aritans, uh, which is uh, native to Africa and North Africa, uh, but it is uh, brought illegally um, to Malaysia without any proper documentation and it was kept as a pet. Uh, unfortunately, the guy who handled this snake got bitten twice on both hands, and he eventually, um, uh, because we do not have uh, the antivenom for this species in Malaysia, uh, he progressed quite rapidly. Uh, within less than 24 hours, he was already in coagulopathy, and he was swollen uh, up to the chest, and he developed sudden cardiac arrest and also not responding after second uh, CPR, uh, so he passed away. Unfortunately, uh, we couldn't get the antivenom uh, appropriate for him because uh, the process of getting this antivenom is quite tedious. Uh, we, we tried to uh, contact uh, Bangkok and uh, QSMI. Uh, they have uh, antivenom for uh, Viper, but not from uh, Africa. They have the one for South America and America. It's called anti uh, But the one that uh, has the anti uh, for Africa is in Singapore Zoo. So we had, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, networking with them before. So we contacted them. Unfortunately, uh, it's in the zoo. So it's uh, working hours. So the case came to us quite late in the afternoon and also nobody is working in the evening in the zoo. So we had to wait until the next morning. And unfortunately, by that time, this guy, uh, the patient uh, succumbed to his condition uh, while the process of uh, procuring, procuring uh, bringing in the antivenom from Singapore Zoo was ongoing. So we, we couldn't even uh, get the antivenom uh, to the airport uh, to, to collect it at the airport. So that is a very, uh, you know, unfortunate case. And uh, to make things matters, uh, we found out that uh, in Malaysia, uh, we do not have the uh, law or act uh, against uh, dangerous uh, animals. So what we have is a wildlife act, which only concern uh, the protection of endangered species of animals. Uh, local and, and also uh, uh, exotic, uh, what is listed on the site's uh, list. So unfortunately, Betis Aritans is not in that list of so-called endangered or protected animal. So uh, because of that, uh, our wildlife uh, do not uh, uh, you know, issue any permit uh, for the bringing in of these animals and many other dangerous animals actually. Uh, because it's not listed on the sites or even in the Wildlife Act list of and protected animals. But we are not talking about protecting the animals. We are talking about protecting humans against dangerous animals. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have, do not have that clause uh, in our Wildlife Act. So uh, compared to the one in Singapore, if in Singapore, their wildlife is very uh, comprehensive. It includes the welfare for endangered and protecting uh, wildlife and also the nature, and also to humans uh, in terms of safety, health, and related matters. So that's clearly put in the uh, Singapore wildlife, whereby they do not have to list down the specific species as long as the species is potentially dangerous in terms of, uh, for example, this uh, British Aritans is highly venomous uh, uh, what you call a potent, uh, it's um, not highly venomous, it's uh, uh, potent, potent uh, venom. Uh, there were lots of uh, documented uh, deaths and also bites in Africa, one of the feared species in Africa, actually. Uh, so, uh, you know, people are bringing in uh, all these animals because there is some loophole in the, uh, maybe in our, in our law. So uh, I'm not sure how it is in uh, uh, our, our ASEAN countries, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Laos, perhaps, or even Germany uh, and Taiwan uh, regarding this issue. So do you have a, a exotic uh, 
snakes uh, venom in your country? Stand by. We can share maybe. In fact, uh, Steve asked Dr. York a similar question on the situation in Germany. So if I comment on that, Dr. York. Uh, yes, after this case, uh, Dr. Dr. Calden uh, 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 told us here about the Beatis Arietans case in, 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 in Malaysia. I, I looked up and, and actually Germany is a federal republic, so we have 16 states and every state decide on their own. And I, I, I saw that, the, that it, it is forbidden to, to have uh, venomous snakes as pets in, in four states, but it's uh, not forbidden, still not forbidden in 12 states. I think there's the same, it's a lop hole. And, and uh, when I was working here in our institute, we were also responsible for, for, for these uh, pet bites. And uh, I saw also three or four uh, bites from, from mainly from, from, uh, from rattlesnakes and also one uh, green mamba snakes, uh, all pets uh, people uh, uh, keep at home. But anyway, even if you forbid it, it's really difficult to control. <laughs> So the people, they, they can buy in the internet, they get them uh, uh, sent in a box, you know, and, 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 they, and, and the, the house is, is, is a protected space. Yeah, nobody can enter your private uh, space and, and uh, it's difficult to control. Uh, but if, if a bite happens and the people come to the hospital, then they may have a problem. Yes. So it should be the, the law, I, I feel, should be for all states, but uh, there is still uh, some uh, a way to go to, to change. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that's my point that I wanted to make in the, my report there on Facebook, is that if, let's say, there is no uh, regulation to say that it is not, uh, is, is not allowed to bring in, then surely then that kind of uh, maybe we can think of uh, what we call a, pro, uh, a proactive a movement whereby those who want to bring uh, don't have to be uh, don't have to hide it, it makes it open but it makes it like you know a, a secondary thing to do is actually to have a plan with the local or uh, registered with the local hospital also for them to also bring in the appropriate antivenom for themselves if something happened and if it's not used for them if someone else got bitten then they can also benefit from that antivenom for example, that's what happened in uh, Thailand, where we a few years ago, uh, uh, they're bringing in a uh, rattlesnake uh, into Thailand uh, for the uh, zoo. And at the same time, they also consulted us to bring in the appropriate antivenom. And they placed this in one hospital and even the snake farm. And it's open for use for anybody else who brought in the uh, rattlesnake for, for their own personal uh, keep. And if they got bitten, which happened uh, a week before this case, someone in Thailand uh, got bitten by a, a, a rattlesnake. And because of our efforts before for bringing in the antivenom for rattlesnakes, uh, a polyvalent in Thailand, so he actually benefited from that, uh, you know, that, that, that efforts uh, we did a few years before that. So he survived, but unfortunately in our case, uh, we did not survive. The reason why Singapore Zoo has the antivenom as well in their keep is because they have a Gabon viper in their display. So they are being responsible uh, rather than you know, not doing anything for their staff. It's because we have uh, our staff working with this dangerous thing. We also are responsible to bring in the antivenom for that uh, uh, snake uh, for our staff. But they don't just use it for them. They open for use for ourselves as well. Anybody else who, who is in need. Uh, because you know it's good that somebody else is using it also because they can replenish it with the new batch of <laughs> antivenom uh, and they don't give us for free we have to buy it from them okay but that's another source of where we can get the antivenom but for us uh, what happened is people don't tell people just keep it quietly if this case did not happen we did we don't know that we have betis aritans in malaysia right <laughs> so just waiting for case to happen then only happens uh, so we had previous cases of two rattlesnake bites, uh, two different species, one horridus and one is uh, <coughs> Crotalus atrox. So we have both species in Malaysia, uh, but they are considered as uh, uh, what you call endangered uh, species They're not supposed to be brought in, uh, but it is available. We also heard there are some people, uh, uh, what you call keeping mambas and also uh, serratus, serratus as well. 
you know, these are all venomous uh, exotic snakes. Uh, can be dangerous, but there's no antivenom. We don't know it is available until someone got bitten and come to the hospital, and then we know. Okay, so that's why the highlight of this case, I think, uh, is very important uh, for our legislation to improve our uh, Wildlife Act, and we are in the process of doing so. Uh, what about in Philippines and uh, Taiwan? Are uh, you guys very strict in terms of how you care for these so-called dangerous uh, venomous animals, exotic? We are, not, we are not concerned about local uh, animal because we do have the antivenom, but the exotics is a, is a bit more challenging, isn't it? Yes, I think um, uh, with regards to our law pertaining to this, um, like, you know, importation of these uh, snakes. Um, I don't think uh, it's as comprehensive as, as it should because um, uh, basically we already have problems with our anti-venom for our very own Nahia, Naja Filipinensis. I mean, the production of it as, uh, as, as it is, is already a problem. So given this importation or uh, appearances of the snakes in our locality will really create a lot of uh, problems. Uh, and um, unfortunately, likely they will all resort to deaths from snake bites because we really don't have an antivenom for any of these other species that are not even uh, supposed to be here in the Philippines. So. Um, yeah, one, 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 one more thing. Yeah, one more thing is that uh, people believe. Oh, uh, we have antivenom. We have polyvalent antivenom. Therefore, polyvalent means for any snake in the world. Uh, this also also happened. Uh, this this type of belief uh, in in the minds of people. Therefore, we have antivenom in Malaysia. We can bring any snake to Malaysia. So oh, that is also okay. wrong. Yeah. yeah, and um, I'm just curious, Doctor Kal. I mean, if if like you can buy it on online, how does it work? Uh, well, this is called the illegal pet trade and illegal pet trade oh, is very big okay. around the world. So they can send anything uh, by post or what or whatever kind. It's very strange how they can smuggle. In Malaysia, <laughs> we, had, we had a case of uh, uh, Philippine uh, pit viper, Philippine pit viper. Uh, being smuggled through uh, through a, a trade on Facebook order and declared as a food item. <laughs> so, you know, crazy. Uh, all these things is happening. And uh, we got a bite from that guy. and uh, But then he did not need any antivenom. He just need uh, hospitalization and supportive care. So lucky for him. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a okay. few cases of exotic snake bite, uh, which we have managed. Uh, it include also, uh, you know, the death uh, uh, from from the scorpion. Eh? You know, uh, what you call death walker. I think I can't remember the name actually, uh, but it's a scorpion. Uh, that one has antivenom, but you know, he they just bought from Facebook. Uh, I don't know how they do it uh, and keep it as a pet, and he got stung and with uh, severe sinus symptoms, but he survived without antivenom. Mm. Uh, and I know that uh, Germany is very big on uh, this uh, wildlife pet pet trade as well in Frankfurt. Yeah, <laughs> this. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, for 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 the anti venom, I also I, I just start learning uh, the about the anti venom market in 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 Africa, but I I feel like uh, to to get a, a proper anti venom against Betis arietans is not so easy. I don't know what kind of anti venom they use in Singapore. But for, for, for West Africa, I, I, I saw that there's only one antivenom which is produced in limited uh, supply from Costa Rica against uh, three snakes. It's, it's Nadja nigricollis, Betis arietans, and uh, Echis oxalatus. And that is maybe an antivenom which is working, or I would trust. And the other antivenoms from India, actually, they are against 10 or even 14 different kinds of snakes. And there's always uh, Betis arietans included, but there are no preclinical testing of these antivenoms. There's a good uh, publication from uh, Julian Poté, uh, and he, he uh, wrote about the 20 uh, antivenoms available for African snakes. 
and many of these antivenoms are not really uh, tested. So you have to be careful. It's not just uh, getting antivenom somewhere, but it's also getting effective antivenom. Yeah, again. so this anti antivitamin is uh, from Mexico, is the same classified as the one from South America. Uh, so it's also for rattlesnake for the one. So they, co they, they produce the one, uh, the antivitamin Africa. So this is for the African uh, uh, species. Um, okay. From, yeah, from so if that one is also documented and there's paper published about its efficacy as well. Mm. So that's mm. one of the market. This all started after Sanofi pulled out from the African <laughs> uh, antivenom production. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, any more questions that maybe we can entertain? Or Derek, would you like to comment about this uh, exotic uh, animal? Is there a problem in Taiwan? Okay, we have this one case, just the uh, it's the Betis species. The patient is uh, illegally to bring it uh, to Taiwan as a pet. And when needed feeding it, it's been bites uh, on the, fin the finger, okay. And the situation is not severe. And he was lied to the physician. He says oh. there's a local snake. And so it was delayed, uh, but luckily, mm. I think that the being an injection volume is not to 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 large so it's, it's only blister and local him large so we give a try to using them uh anti viper anti venom local production to treat but uh, i think this that succeed but it's pretty hard to define a succeed i mean is that uh, the 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 problem of the finger is being stopped and we are not choosing another uh, viper, uh, uh, anti-vipers, anti-venom, uh, because that we uh, just uh, searching for the paper. They say it's the main component of the BTS is mainly uh, metallopolis. And in Taiwan, I think that um, pit vipers, anti-pit viper venom is more uh, suitable for treatment. But it's just a try. Uh, as you say, uh, I think that it's pretty hard to cross neutralize, especially for local damage. Uh, because that we're using the mice to do the testing, there's uh, some defects is that they all testing for neurotoxic or maybe acute toxicity. For local damage or maybe sub, uh, subacute damage, it will not be represent. Is there yeah, any law? Is there, yeah, is there any law in Taiwan uh, against or protecting against? Yes. Uh, so that, yes. that that was was that 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 case was illegal illegally brought in or? Yes, it's illegally brought in, and actually, we our center was the uh, joined that uh, a, a project because it's pretty hard to distinguish the cobra, you know. Yeah. If we someone is bringing the cobra, you can say it's not you try and you have no evidence to prove this with not just the menses or maybe calcia. It was say that the morphology is that maybe this mutate or something else. So we do the venom testing, so giving them profile and proves it's guilty. Yeah. That's what we do for for governments. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So any more uh, questions uh, before we finish off? Uh, nope, the questions are currently being entertained by the panelists in the chat box. Uh, we can move on to our next itinerary in favor okay. of time. So, thank you, everyone. But, yeah, thank you very much, doctors, the panelists, uh, Prof. Calden, for your comments. Uh, so, to, to move on with our final uh, itinerary, which is the closing remarks, followed by the quiz, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ruth Sabrina to give our closing remarks. So, Please give uh, Dr. Ruth a very warm welcome. To introduce her, she is an emergency physician with special interest in clinical toxin toxicology and toxinology. She completed her subspecialty training under the Malaysian Ministry of Health program in clinical toxicology in 2019. Currently, she is working in the emergency and trauma department in the Raja Promissory Bainan Hospital, Ipoh Perak, Malaysia. And she is currently the president of the Malaysian Society of Toxinology for the 2021 to 2023 session. Without further ado, Dr. Ruth Sabrina, the mic is yours. 
Uh, thank you uh, to uh, the MC. Okay, Assalamualaikum and a good day. Um, so, first of all, thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me on behalf of the uh, MST Rex and also the CEP SIG for Clinical Toxinology of Malaysia. So, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, to the presenters for a very good presentation. Um, I, this is the second time that uh, we are conducting the webinar uh, for, uh, with similar topics. And um, I believe that actually we have uh, covered a lot of uh, issues or uh, things to discuss. Uh, also, thank you to our fellow panelists uh, that comes away uh, from uh, Philippines, Germany, and also Taiwan for sharing your wisdom and also knowledge to uh, all of our participants. Uh, we do hope that uh, all the participants have learned uh, something. Uh, in fact, actually, um, uh, a lot of things uh, that we can learn from today's session um, and ultimately can use the knowledge uh, to treat our patients later on uh, when we become a, a doctor in the future. So finally, if anybody asks me, uh, is clinical toxinology is relevant for medical students? So um, my answer would be none other than yes, uh, with proper curricular and content. And uh, lastly, I would like to share a quote of wisdom to all of you. So uh, work on the strength to overcome the weaknesses and do not enucleate. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel and indeed with hardship comes ease. So this quote actually is uh, reflecting the humble journey of our clinical toxicology in Malaysia at least. Uh, we hope that we can deliver more in the future. So with that, um, thank you and uh, have a nice uh, session next. Thank you very much, Dr. Sabrina. That was a very nice quote. Uh, hopefully, everyone has managed to benefit from uh, Doctor's speech, uh, closing remark. To move on to the next Kahoot quiz session. So, can you announce first? Can you announce first uh, what we will get for the Kahoot? Ah, uh... uh, yes, yes. Uh, so, um, this Kahoot quiz comprises of eight questions. So, everyone try your best. The winner will be given the the prize of. Uh, one of these special edition of Prof. Calden's and team's uh, publication, this book called uh, Land, Snakes, uh, Land Snakes of Medical Significance in Malaysia, third edition. Uh, Yishun, can you please uh, show, the, show the book? Yeah, this this book. So hopefully this is a good uh, motivator for everyone to try your best in the Kahoot quiz. I will send the link to the Kahoot quiz on in the chat box so everyone can click into it and join. Uh, alternatively, you can also join the quiz via this link, kahoot.it with the game pin 4875154. Okay, so we will now wait for the participants to go on to Kahoot. Uh, in the meantime, I will share my Kahoot screen, yeah? Great, so we have our participants flooding in now. Uh, this is the Kahoot uh, quiz mainframe, the user interfa interface. So we have 26 people on the quiz platform. So keep them coming. Panelists, doctors, feel free to join the quiz. It will be fun. Uh, of course, uh, <laughs> should, should any of the panelists win, we have to consult Prof. Calden whether they are eligible to win the prize or do we give it to the next one? Oh, no, 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 they can't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, then. So, uh, yep, keep on coming. We will start in about a minute with uh, the amount of participants we have. It's quite sufficient for a good competition. Yeah, it will be fun so, anyway. Uh, but yeah. the winner, and the winner, uh, please uh, provide your uh, name. name, full name <laughs> and contact and also address. Because we will have, uh, if you're not with, in our hospital, we will have to post uh, the book to you, okay? So uh, stay on and uh, provide your details to the uh, secretariat. Yeah. Okay, good luck. All the best. 
All right. How many of us? 30? Any more? 32. Any more joining? We will start in about a half a minute. So whoever yeah, we have 32 wants to join. It's coming and going can... up. Any more? 33. Okay. We'll start. We'll start. Uh, okay, great. Shall we start now? Anyone? Any one of your friends still? Yeah, 35. Can... Okay. Any more coming in? We have 44 in here. So shall we wait for a bit more? Okay. 36, okay. 35. Okay, shall we? All right, so we shall begin now. Uh, ready, get set, and go. Yes. So, we have our winner, Chris. So can Chris identify uh, themselves? Okay. Yes. Okay, congratulations. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you to the panelists. And once again, I'd like to thank the panelists, Dr. Milia, Dr. York, Dr. Derek, uh, Prof. Khaldun, Dr. Sabrina, Dr. Munawa for joining us. And thank you so much for all your questions to the audiences. I hope this was an eye-opener to everybody. Uh, who knows, one day some of us would fill the shoes of the panelists in uh, spearheading the field of clinical technology, and this might be the first step to a very long journey, right? So I hope everyone have been, has benefited from this session in widening perspectives and gaining knowledge. It was a pleasure to have all of you with us today. Uh, thank you once again for your time and attention. Take care and have a good evening ahead. So please don't forget to scan the QR code, yeah? Or we will also send a link to the e-cert, will we? For those who have difficulty scanning the QR code, you can click on the link. Okay, thank yeah. you. Once again, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. Well done. Thank you so much. Sama -sama. <laughs> We want Can't. that book, Dr. Carl. Send one to the Philippines. Uh, but <laughs> you organize, organize a session and we can sponsor the book. <laughs> All right. I'll talk, I'll talk to Dr. Um, Pat and JD. And yeah. So also any, of, any, of your, any of your Rex program, uh, if we have, uh, no matter where, we can sponsor the books for you. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Selamat po. Selamat. Okay. Thank you semua. Thank you semua. Good job, ma. Good job, Thank Karen. Talking to us. Good job, Azam. Thank you, Azam. Perform, Azam. Perform, na yah dina pun perform, na. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for supporting.